in the afternoon session and really humbled by the support that we got, you know, tremendous, like uh, I think over about a thousand people have joined. Uh, we're not expecting such a high turnout, but this is really good. Uh, the, it just shows that the community is vibrant and people want to hear from some of the most senior leaders and technical ex ex execs. Um, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, you know, we have a very powerful lineup. Uh, we have uh, some of the uh, top end users um, of, of open source uh, who are going to explain, you know, what they are thinking. Uh, they are everywhere from sort of the at and of the world with Andre uh, or uh, Subert Graf from Walmart and, or Dr. JMS from, uh, from the DARPA project. Um, and then we also have uh, some of our uh, community play, play, uh, players, uh, startups, innovators, and uh, you know, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So very packed afternoon. So without going into uh, and spending too much time, I want to introduce our first uh, presenter, um, and, uh, you know, a, a company that has kind of uh, taken their, uh, their roots from, from sort of the storage world, but moved to containerization, cloud native, and then into the telecom as a virtual function, uh, a company called Robin.io. It's a startup here in the Bay Area. And uh, from Robin, we have a, uh, an executive, uh, Mehran Haldipur, uh, who's the VP of Techlands, to talk about, you know, how startups have been able to uh, build on this um, vision of open source and what they have been doing to help some of the end customers uh, of there. So uh, with, with, uh, with that, uh, take it on, Maren. Part of this, um... Uh, quite an interesting event uh, and um, I share the stage uh, with the, some of the very um, important players in the space. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I thought maybe I'll start talking a little bit about what Robin is and does. Uh, if you maybe have the same first slide uh, on the screen. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about um, Robin, in terms of um, background and uh, um, how we can approach the market uh, uh, and what our mission and strategy has been. We basically actually started in the enterprise space. But our primary focus has been to enable um, an, an open infrastructure for deploying of complex applications on Kubernetes. And uh, as uh, Arpit mentioned, we started uh, uh, providing a storage layer for Kubernetes and extended to a complete end-to-end -end platform and provide um, uh, uh, capabilities to be able to deploy uh, the entire um, uh, cloud native infrastructure for the for entire 5G stack in production today. Uh, we have built, uh, we believe on the ecosystem and partnerships and alliances and, and uh, being open, we, we, we have tried to uh, uh, extend our ecosystem as much as possible. And I would say um, uh, Robin has uh, been quite successful in that space. And uh, we, we'd be able to prove that uh, um, open cloud native infrastructures could be uh, a vehicle to provide significant value to certain uh, uh, deployment of uh, 5G and Edge. And uh, our uh, mission and objective uh, stated is to be to enable onboarding and life cycle management of uh, 5G and Edge applications on uh, uh, seamless uh, and easy to manage. If I may get uh, the second slide, please. So uh, I wanted to kind of start the conversation by kind of talking about um, uh, the three-pronged approach to uh, and Robin's vision uh, for this space. Uh, we, we feel that the um, cloud native and containerized infrastructure is, is a very important uh, uh, strategy that uh, should be adopted uh, for the edge use cases. We see a, an infrastructure can accommodate uh, both um, CNFs and VNFs on a common managed infrastructure. We, we, we think the uh, openness is critical, uh, being able to 
have an open platform that the variety of network functions could be deployed and onboarded uh, uh, on a common uh, uh, managed environment uh, running in Kubernetes uh, is a, a critical strategy that would drive self-realization and disaggregation in telco space, I think, in a, in a more cost-effective manner. And we also think that the key value drivers of the open infrastructure is, uh, is to be able to also deliver uh, automation and orchestration layer uh, uh, that is, is hyper automated. It uh, starts from the bare metal or infrastructure all the way up to network functions and creates a delivery model that uh, uh, is seamless and uh, adaptive and can accommodate uh, uh, a variety of applications uh, using open and standard interfaces. So uh, this is our kind of a, a global view of the mission and an objective that we, um, we pursued um, uh, for Robin. So uh, if I may have the second next slide, please. So we think we actually think that edge computing has um, bring significant promise uh, uh, to uh, uh, not only the operators, but other enterprise space as well. Uh, we feel a, a deployment model, this kind of de edge deployment model brings continuous uh, availability uh, and distributed data models that could uh, provide uh, a much more resiliency to the um, uh, infrastructure, the uh, service delivery infrastructure for operators uh, as well as uh, enterprise customers alike. Uh, we feel that uh, the fact that you have um, uh, close, uh, low latency connections and have the data available at the edge enables the set of new use cases that uh, can deliver uh, value to enterprise customers, including faster AI that is location awareness or, or um, automated uh, reaction uh, uh, or, or delivery of services around changes in the infrastructure in a much more seamless way. And we also think that um, uh, this whole um, uh, delivery model would uh, create an infrastructure that gives you optimized data placement. Placement, uh, you at, at one hand uh, have high throughput, low latency networks that connects edge to the data central data centers that allows you to have more of the data dis distributed centrally. And at the same time, because of the network interfaces, much more data could be ingested with the low latency at the edge and analyze at the edge. So you can place the data uh, uh, where it makes sense uh, and deliver value from the data where it makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think uh, um, one of the questions was, <laughs> Uh, to come up with some views around what makes uh, uh, a key success factor for the edge. Uh, I think yeah, having a, a thriving ecosystem, and this is actually exactly what uh, open networking uh, in the organizations uh, uh, are doing and enabling is key. Uh, uh, as I say, it takes a village. Uh, it's not all about uh, you know a unified model of uh, uh, that could be bought from a single vendor. There needs to be a, a lot of disaggregation, open standards, availability to pick the right set of functionality from the right providers and being able to accommodate them in the common infrastructure. We think hybrid cloud and multi-cloud is important. Uh, however, it needs to be married with a, a unified automation platform. It is essential to be able to place your infrastructure in the cloud on-prem and move workload between them. But uh, you can't do that at the expense of complexity, at the expense of um, uh, doing a lot of manual work, being able to have dependency on the, in the infrastructure. I think containerized and open uh, standards allows you to a way to build an application stack that could run well on-prem and the cloud and hyper automation could be placed to orchestrate workload across data centers, no matter where they're located. I think this would enable and open some doors about uh, uh, complete uh, uh, orchestrated, uh, well-managed uh, infrastructure that extends from on-prem to the cloud. 
uh, and uh, enables uh, the appropriate uh, placement of workload and reduces the cost uh, for the service delivery across the board. Um, uh, we also have a true believer in containerization. Uh, we see a lot of that uh, taking momentum in the market today. Um, it is a lot of uh, um, uh, many of the ORAN providers, for example, are moving to containerized foundation. I think it gives you a better ecosystem, uh, much better efficiency, improved availability. There's a number of benefits that could be derived uh, from containers, uh, building a containerized foundation. It also, the only caveat here is that it needs to be able to run uh, the traditional applications, uh, um, VM-based applications and so on, as well as containerized applications in a common infrastructure to be able to um, uh, uh, take advantage of uh, a container deployment with uh, uh, automation on scaling, healing, orchestration, and so on, without having to completely remap uh, your application portfolio and, and restructure how you do services. Uh, and I think that would uh, enable uh, a new set of edge applications uh, and a much faster adoption of edge applications. I think a lot, there's a lot of um, 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 best practices and, and, and IT um, uh, 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 policies and procedures that, that have been placed uh, that, people, that the enterprise customers are used to. There's a whole new set of uh, um, operational aspects uh, that telco uh, uh, and operators are used to. And IoT, we, we bring a third uh, <laughs> a set of um, needs into the space. So we need uh, to think about, uh, uh, especially around operations and orchestration and management, a blend of all these practices to be able to uh, achieve the kind of efficiency that is needed to deploy uh, critical apps and manage them at the edge at scale of thousands of nodes and, uh, uh, in a seamless manner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I talked a little bit about this, but is a, and the picture seems to be a little blurry. But the, 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 there are a number of uh, um, uh, infrastructure decisions that needs to be made in terms of where the data should be placed, where the, anal where the analysis of that data should take place, what are the um, what are the best things to run on the edge, what are the best things to run on the core, how much cloud participation should be on your infrastructure. But as you see, uh, a containerization uh, and the fact that 5G and low latency networking would bring a higher throughput uh, and a lower latency interconnect between the edge nodes and the data center, you're now going to be um, having the capability of right place the application, if you will, and its data and do the analysis in the, in the, in the correct location with the optimum result without having to worry about uh, bandwidth, latency considerations, and it opens up doors where a lot of new set of applications, uh, deployment policies that I think would expand the use of edge and edge applications in the market today. Um, next slide, please. You know, I, I, I think, uh, uh, enterprises especially, especially uh, have seen the benefit of CICD and how it could apply to accelerating time to value uh, an application deployment. We think a challenge that we should all take on and consider is to enable CICD processes and procedures to more apply to the edge, be able to uh, build a model that uh, fast application delivery could, 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 uh, could exist in, in, in a complex network like this. Uh, the same processes that um, uh, enterprise customers have been benefiting for onboarding and acceleration of deployment and customization uh, and um, additional service delivery models uh, and do it in a fast manner that CICD has been delivering uh, as a promise. They should, should apply to more of the use cases. I mean, if you start looking at um, infrastructure point of view, uh, th things around smart cities, uh, smart factories, smart farming, 
uh, all the way to things like content distribution. Uh, there are a large set of opportunities for incremental revenue generation and use cases. And to be able to monetize all these and get to a point that uh, we get to a fast, faster 5G deployment and at the same time, more, uh, more edge applications are deployed. CICD processes and, and, and uh, infrastructure would be an important uh, um, contributor, I think, uh, to this uh, journey. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about uh, Robin belief in open strategy, source strategy and what our approach has been uh, and so on. Uh, we are basically uh, first started by um, ensuring that uh, we have a complete Kubernetes based strategy and we don't touch a single code of Kubernetes, anything that we do it depends on Kubernetes, uh, uh, all the APIs are open source, the way our storage talks to uh, Kubernetes, the way our CNI level talks to Kubernetes is standard, standard. Any application can run on Kubernetes, will run on Robin. We, we, publish, we are published uh, uh, our APIs and, and are going to continue to do so uh, uh, with, with additional capabilities around MDCAP, our orchestration platform uh, later in, in this summer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we try to uh, uh, build a model that um, different um, uh, elements and uh, of Robin itself, for example, uh, could be uh, adopted uh, uh, for different use cases by different partnerships. And we, we build a number of those partnerships to try to extend, expand the openness of the platform. Our storage layer is completely um, open. We can run on any Kubernetes platform, on any cloud. We are making more and more strides toward our uh, uh, cloud native platform to make it uh, more adaptable and uh, to run on any Kubernetes distribution and so on. And uh, we're planning to publish our API. So I think openness of what uh, we do understand the need for enhancing certain capabilities of the open source community tools and provide production level support on them and so on. And there's a business to be had to do so, but I think keeping the environment open is essential uh, 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 than um, uh, as essential strategy for Robin. I do have a question. Uh, Arpit, should I just answer it or should you want to wait till the end? I think we may run out of time, so if you could wrap it up, yeah. Okay, sure. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we can then. Okay, so these are some of our business priorities in terms of where we're taking the platform. Uh, enhancing our ecosystem partnership is key for us. We wanted to get to a point that uh, uh, we have more and more um, from application to infrastructure side up. We're working with the OEMs on hardware, on the, on the on the different uh, edge applications uh, for CDN and other, other use cases uh, and be enhancing our hyper automation platform to be able to uh, be as open as possible and be, be available to uh, extend its use case around orchestration and lifecycle automation that applies to a variety of workloads and across a variety of infrastructure, including cloud. Next slide. Uh, keep going, yeah, uh, sorry. Okay, so these are um, some of the technology priorities we've taken on and I, I can make this the last slide. Basically, uh, enhancing our ability to run stateful apps on, on Kubernetes has been one key priority for Robin. We have a number of, number of enhancements we've done to create the most highest performance storage platform that supports very complex applications, including things like Oracle Rack and SAP uh, to, give, to give you an example. Uh, Enhance our ability to run apps on the edge is another uh, uh, priority to be able to kind of extend the networking requirements and so on, to be able to uh, run um, applications that require network accelerations, for example, or, or require things like SROV and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and enhancing those capabilities to be able to extend what could run at the edge. Uh, uh, we are expanding our orchestration layer to do more hybrid cloud focus. We, we, we think that 
uh, the answers would be a, a combination of on-prem and cloud always. And we build mobility functions within the platform so you can take an applications from one platform on-prem and run it in any cloud. And without a, a complete disregard to the infrastructure peculiarities of when you run your application. And I think that's an important part of the strategy. Uh, and obviously um, uh, being able to run both VMs and containers on the infra common infrastructure as efficiently uh, and orchestrate them together would open a lot of doors in bringing a lot of new applications to containerize infrastructure platforms. Uh, and we also think that beyond instantiation and management, building platform that does day two operations is also quite essential in making the code deployment successful. So I'll pick one and I pass it on to you. I think I'm- gonna... No, I, I think that's fantastic. And I know, um, you know, there, there were a couple of questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll probably take that offline. I uh, just want to, you know, make sure that we are on track for, for the rest of the schedule. So really thank you, Maran, for doing this. Uh, for sure. Sorry, I'm running a little late, I tried. No, no, thank you. All right, so with that, uh, we move to our next speaker who is uh, one of the well-known uh, leaders in the open source cloud native industry. Uh, our own uh, Priyanka Sharma, who's the GM for CNCF. Uh, so with that, Priyanka. I am delighted to be here today. Thanks for having me. I hope everyone do, is doing extremely well. We're all very close to the end of this pandemic and I hope you're feeling that excitement as I am right now. Speaking of pandemic, that's what my talk today is going to be about. So I'd like to start my slides, please. Awesome, great. So today's agenda, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about cloud native in the pre-pandemic era, how the cloud computing and cloud native rose up. You've been obviously hearing a ton about cloud in context of the edge in the previous talk, and I'm sure before that as well. Um, we'll talk about how cloud native accelerated and then uh, during the pandemic. And finally, what can we look forward to in the post pandemic era and what that means for you folks who are focused on telecommunications, on edge uh, computing and the surrounding industry. Um, next slide, please. So pre pandemic era, rise of cloud and cloud native. Next slide. When we think about the biggest trends in our industry, right? The big one, in my opinion, was going from virtualization to cloud native. In 2001 is when VMs became a thing uh, and that kept growing. It kept getting bigger with in, uh, infrastructure as a service, PaaS. And then in 2010 is when open source really started making moves in the world of infrastructure. In 2013, I think it was momentous because with the rise of Docker, we had containers. Suddenly people could, could break their uh, large monolithic applications into microservices and put them in their own containers. Excellent. And then in 2015, with the open sourcing of Kubernetes from Google, we had a container open so an open source container orchestrator to dynamically orchestrate these containers and optimize our resource utilization. This was the beginning of cloud native and the beginning of a really exciting journey. Next slide. The cloud native compute, computing foundation built a global community around the momentum of the Kubernetes project and added many more surrounding it. And we built a critical mass by hosting events and activities and engaging with all parts of the globe. Our strategy paid off when, if you look at this, uh, these numbers here, these are pre-pandemic numbers of people who attended our flagship KubeCon Cloud Native Con in person. So 23,000 people in uh, 2019. Next slide. Overall, it was a very frothy, exciting time. We were having growth all around fastest growing open source community in the world. All major cloud providers became platinum members and we hosted the largest open source conferences. This was unprecedented momentum for any open source community. Next slide. As we grew and then were suddenly hit by a pandemic, there was questions, concerns. 
what does this mean for cloud native? What does this mean for this ecosystem? Next slide. And to share with you how things have gone, I'd like to talk about COVID in general. Our most hatest favorite topic, I would say, COVID-19. What did we learn? With COVID-19, a lot of trends that were slowly percolating really accelerated. We learned to work from home. Events became virtual. We recently, last year in um, October, hosted our, uh, November, sorry, hosted KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon North America with over 23,000 attendees in just one event compared to 23,000 in 20, uh, 2019 for all of them put together. Um, and now we have one more coming in uh, May with um, uh, KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon EU, which will also be virtual. As we look forward to events, we are always going to do hybrid. Virtual will always be part of our strategy. Similarly, restaurants had to learn, learn to take online orders. And then on the very other end, us, as other end of the technology complexity spectrum, we needed privacy respecting contact tracing within three months because of COVID. mRNA technology needed to produce a vaccine stat. So things really speeded up for what was needed from technology in this kind of pandemic era. Thinking about all that, do you all remember when digital transformation was a buzzword? With, with COVID-19, digital transformation has become the mainstay of most companies. Before it was something to aim for, to think about. With the challenges of COVID, with the world going virtual, every company has been jumping in. A lot of companies I speak to day to day, they tell me, oh, it is within COVID 19 that we have hired majority of our cloud native staff. It is within this time frame that we have modernized. The pressures are totally different now. Next slide. So COVID-19, because of these pressures to go virtual, have accelerated cloud native. There's generally been a market shift in innovation. Open source has become the mainstay for a lot of um, infrastructure uh, technologies. People are using open source much more than legacy IT vendors. Even before the pandemic, it was expected that two thirds of enterprises will be prolific software producers by 2025 with over 90% new apps cloud native. Everything like this has accelerated. With the coronavirus outbreak, people, 60% of the respondents of the state of the cloud report said that cloud usage will exceed prior plans because of the pandemic. I mean, we don't need stats and numbers and reports to tell us that. It, think of our own lives. As I said, we're ordering food online, we're ordering groceries, we are doing online banking. The more we can do from our computer, from our home, that we prefer that. So what does this all mean for the CNCF? Well, next slide. I'm proud to tell you that COVID truly accelerated CNCF. In membership, we have 20% growth today with 612 members compared to 2019. In contributors, these are people who are producing code for the many projects that are in CNCF. We have a 46% growth with over 118,000 people from around the world, 173 countries plus, by the way, who are contributing to our projects. And our projects have grown by 93% to 85 today. We started this conversation talking about Kubernetes and how that brought on the cloud native um, revolution. There are 84 other projects supporting Kubernetes in that ecosystem today. Next slide. Telcos and other edge providers understand this value. I'm proud to tell you that AT&T joined us as a platinum member recently, as did Cox Communications, which is another te uh, telecommunications provider in the US. Both are making waves with uh, cloud native on telcos and cloud native on the edge. This momentum, next slide. Why are all these people interested? Why is so much growth happening? At the end of the day, I'm so proud to tell you that it's because of the diversity, the resilience that our diversity of team cloud native brings. We are today 6.5 million cloud native developers, which is up by 1.8 million from Q2 2019. 2.7 million use Kubernetes and 60% of backend developers now use containers. The more our numbers improve, increase, the more that people contribute, the better, more secure our software becomes. It also means 
there's enough talent to go around to help end users, to help telco providers, to help um, edge companies adopt cloud native technologies into their practice. Our numbers across geographies, technologies, genders, and other demograph demographics is our biggest strength. Even when it comes to people self-learning, educating, getting bigger and better in cloud native, the numbers are increasing. Today, 70,000 developers out there are certified for, as either Kubernetes admin or Kubernetes application developers or Kubernetes security specialists. These 70,000 people are out there ready to help anyone making their digital transformation cloud native journey. Our diversity powered resilience is what makes us ubiquitous in today's modern technology world. Next slide. There's a lot of projects that support this, as I said, and you can feel free to take a look at all of our logos over here. The slides will be available to you. Next slide. Um, you see a bunch of projects in our sandbox as well, which is a new uh, type of project that we have released in uh, 2020. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, the world's largest cloud and software companies are part of our ecosystem, and you can take a look at them there. Um, there's also a link to check out our end users. We enjoy the largest end user community of any ecosystem out there, any foundation ecosystem out there with 145 plus. Next slide. Um, and finally, cloud native ecosystem is frothy as ever. There's so many acquisitions. There's so many new startups who join us. Check out our landscape and the links provided to get more insight. Next slide. All of this is to tell you that COVID-19 was not a blip in our existence. COVID-19 was a game changer. If you think about World War II, People refer to the period before and after as pre-war and post-war respectively. That's because society fundamentally changed because of this war. I expect that the generations to come will think similarly about the pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 eras. So with that in mind, next slide. What does the post-pandemic era look like? I adventure that cloud native is going to be the building block of the coming times. Next slide. When we think about what is coming, we have, as I said, everybody is hastened to be online. Everyone's gone through this, are going through the digital transformation as fast as possible. Alongside that, the num amount of data generated from our devices, the amount of information available, and the modern compute at the edge is creating information and with ever smarter neural networks and decentralization, we are going to be able to build experiences for human beings, technologies that are nuanced for their specific needs and tastes so that it's a much richer experience. All this information that's available will be harnessed to create the next generation of our technological movement. Putting together big data, putting together uh, compute at the edge, putting together all of this stuff needs to happen all the while delighting customers in the way they're used to. And that's something cloud native knows best. So the modern era of technology can only be ushered in when backed by cloud native principles and cloud native people. Let's talk a little bit about how telcos and edge companies are thinking about this. Next slide. Telcos are actively adopting cloud native today. They want better resource efficiency, better resiliency and availability. And they want, most importantly, higher development velocity. Next slide. Um, there are a lot of tools available. There's a telecom user group where folks come together and discuss thought leadership and learn from each other. And then we've created the CNF working group or the cloud native network function working group which helps define what does cloud native look like in a network function. And it relies upon the CNF test suite and test bed. And as I told you last time we spoke to watch this space for more information, next slide, I do have progress to report. The CNF working group is defining what makes a telco application cloud native. We have best practices that can be adopted by CNF de developers and operators. These write-ups of best practices, use cases, requirements, gap analyses, and similar documents are going to be available. And in, this is the beauty here. The individuals and organizations 
can choose to incorporate cloud native best practices along with other standards. A great example would be a company choosing to use both cloud native and Etsy NFV specs. We are here to make you succeed, to help you win. And that's what the CNF group is working on. Next slide. When it comes to edge computing, there's lot, lots, lots of challenges we face. There's millions of locations, billions of devices, and really small margins for error and profit. We have reduced control, constrained resources, risky devices and locations, limited connectivity, and delays and disconnections. Well, next slide. Cloud Native is here to help you. Kubernetes was, as you all know, born for massive data centers, but it is now extended just like Linux was for embedded to have projects and support available for this new world of edge computing. I've listed some, pro oh, sorry, I said next slide. Yes, so Kubernetes, as I said, has been for, uh, was born in massive data centers, but is ready for uh, extension into the edge, just like it, Linux did for embedded. There's a bunch of projects that I've listed here that are already happening that are in CNCF that are ready and able to help you as you go to the edge and bring cloud native with it. Uh, I encourage you to have your developers check these out. I encourage you to get them participating. There's a lot of value here that's just waiting to be utilized by you as it is already being utilized by others. So next slide. With that said, there, it's obvious that a lot's going on. I highly encourage you to get involved. Get involved with Team Cloud Native today. We have a Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group that meets bi-weekly, so there's a link here to join the list. I already mentioned the CNF Working Group. Uh, it, it meets every Monday at 1600 UTC, and there's a link. Finally, let's ourselves get educated and teach each other. We, I urge you to fill out our Edge micro survey. Micro means no more than eight questions. Um, and it's not, it's not, <laughs> you don't have to write the answers. It's all multiple choice. Um, I encourage you to come and fill this survey out so that we can release results of what's happening in at the Edge with Cloud Native. Next slide. I truly believe the future is bright. Team Cloud Native is a community of doers. You've seen that with the momentum we bring to everything we do, with the excitement, the passion, the technical brilliance that we bring to everything. That's why we're being expanded into various technology and industry verticals. KubeCon Cloud NativeCon, that's coming soon, has so many co-located events that just show off this brilliance of the community. We have everything from Cloud Native Rust Day to Kubernetes AI Day. All these things are happening, people are working on things and end users are benefiting. They are thriving, they're growing, they're contributing back. This is an ecosystem that is going to last. Next slide. If you want to get more involved and understand more of Cloud Native for Telco and the Edge, I have two specific co-located events at KubeCon that I would recommend for you. I would recommend attending Kubernetes on Edge Day, and which is on May 4th and Magma Day, which is about a project that uh, Arpit has probably told you about already that has just entered um, uh, Linux Foundation, which is happening on May 3rd. Next slide. To get deep, more deeply connected, to get more involved, you got to be at Cloud, KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon. Come here as I expound deeper into my thoughts on the post-pandemic era and the role Cloud Native's community is playing, going to play in it. We are going live May 4th through 7th, 2021. And I was able to finagle a code for you uh, from the events team to get a discounted price uh, of $50. So feel free to use this code. Feel free to disperse this amongst your teams so they can also benefit from it. Use the registration link and join us there. I really hope to see you again very soon. Thank you, next slide. Thank you very much. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. I would love to welcome you into Team Cloud Native and work with you for innovation tomorrow, day after, and ever more to come. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Priyanka, and that was good. I think I picked up three very important uh, messages from your talk for the, for the networking and edge users, right? Number one, as we move from sort of VM to long-term containers, there's a 
there's a hybrid model that is running right now, both in the infrastructure and the applications. But you want to think cloud native first. So check there. I think the telecom and edge users absolutely love that. The second one is, as we have tools within CNCF on VNF, CNF testbed, uh, as well as the working group, I think the collaboration between Anuket, which is LF networking projects, and the integration is, is very tight and uh, is being worked so that, you know, it's seamless across Absolutely. technologies, yeah. And then finally on the edge, I think, um, you know, several of the LF edge blueprints, Crano, et cetera, they, they build on Kubernetes, right? So I think, uh, I think the collaboration, I, I really welcome and, and appreciate the collaboration between our two organizations in the community. So thank you for, for supporting that. Absolutely, it's been amazing. We work together folks pretty much every week and the result is that your lives get easier. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, and again, reminder to everybody, uh, you know, if you need to ask questions, this, these are live sessions. Uh, there's a Q and A button on your session. Please kind of type it in and we will take these right after the, after the session. So thank you very much, uh, Priyanka. All right. Okay, so now we have three end users that are going to talk about, you know, what they see in open source and how they see evolution for their particular um, domain, if you may. I'm just use, using the word uh, generically. Um, and we're going to start off first with uh, one of the, 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 the smartest and the most uh, intelligent person I have met uh, in, the, in the past uh, several decades. I mean, ever since the Bell Research Days. Um, uh, Dr. Jonathan Smith, he is at DARPA right now uh, since 2017, I think. And he's also uh, a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he leads several, several projects across both universities and DARPA, you know, DOD, you know, many, many things. But more importantly, he's a technologist and a strategist. And we recently announced the collaboration between the uh, DARPA, DOD, and, and Linux Foundation to allow for uh, open source to be utilized for, uh, uh, you know, applications and innovation in the government space. And again, keep in mind, you know, uh, this, is, this is a very interesting use case. Uh, you know, I won't call this as an industry or a vertical like a manufacturer, but it is, it is a real end user that's building on what you all have done. So without any uh, further uh, delay, I would love to welcome Dr. Jonathan Smith. I think that what, what I'd like to emphasize is that the primary locus for collaboration with, with the Linux Foundation has been a project that we call Ops 5G. Um, it's Open Programmable Secure 5G. So the name tells you everything. Um, it's open uh, source. Um, the focus is security and the particular problem that we're trying to wrestle with is the advances, some of them being the programmability of the uh, edge and some of them being programmability of the um, infrastructure. For example, the, uh, the um, uh, virtual functions. So what we did um, was we, we looked at how to um, deal with the problem of securing 5G. So our analysis showed that there were gonna be hardware and software elements, but that the hardware was gonna be fairly generic. Um, so the locus of, um, for, for example, security, security threats at the edge or security threats in the, um, in the core 
we're, we're all going to be in the software. Um, and, and that's, that's not surprising. You know, there's, there's a lot of complexity there and, um, there's a lot of people with expertise. Now, um, I think that the, the fact that we're driving so much functionality, um, out to, out to phones, uh, and edge devices tells us that we, you know, we have to protect them. So what we did with Ops 5G, and we're delighted to be working with um, the, the Linux Foundation and the larger open source community, because um, there, there is a, a very strong uh, case to be made for transparency as perhaps the most fundamental um, advantage in security. Because for example, one, one issue that we can, um, can, can get traction on is we can, get the, um, we can get the source code, we can use various analytic tools that R&D um, and practitioners have and analyze it, and we can be confident that it's running um, using integrity checks. So our, our model was to try to transform, as, as DARPA does, um, transform the ecosystem for 5G. Um, we, we, we had done some work um, uh, and uh, we identified Linux Foundation as, um, you know, an ideal way to do what we call transition. And transition means that it reaches mobile network operators, vendors, et cetera. So um, in my slides, I, I, you know, I illustrate a, you know, a flow um, from left to right as, as we go along the timeline from basically a box shipped with, um, with customized opaque software systems where we don't know what's going on to community built software systems, um, perhaps with advanced elements that anybody can look at and, um, you know, they, they see can address other threats that might exist. So, um, so the Ops 5G program is structured into four technical areas. The four technical areas are focused, um, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the, the last three first because they're very 5G focused and, and the first one is somewhat more open source focused. The 5G uh, focused um, pieces are, um, we're focused on IoT devices and what we're trying to do is use the, um, you know, the, sum, the, 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 the somewhat um, imprecise um, uh, zero trust model. When, 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 we, when we looked at that, our interpretation of it was it was basically a way to talk about least privilege. And um, systems people are familiar with that. And the idea is that you only open the interfaces that you need uh, for the task that you're doing at the time. So, you know, we've, we've, we've got work uh, that we've chartered and paid for and gotten started on uh, IoT software systems that are intended to be zero trust. They're, in some cases, they have very cool edge properties. Um, 
you know, for example, uh, one of the one of the projects has the notion that um, you can do some of the cryptographic work on the mech um, to you know to offload work on <laughs> on the actual edge device. Um, the um, the, 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 the concern uh, with, with programmability is that um, if you look at if, if you look at many examples that we've seen throughout history, programmability is something that is two-faced. Uh, you know it, it, um, it offers opportunity uh, as, um, you know, in basically creating exciting new systems and applications, but it also potentially, uh, because of the complexity introduced by the, the software machine plus the hardware machine can, um, can introduce uh, errors. So one of our, one of our focal points in, uh, in TA3 is secure slices. And so what that does is that focuses on, um, you know, our, our view of how to uh, isolate slices from, from each other. Um, TA4 is focused on um, programmability again. The real objective of TA4 is to try to shift uh, shift the model of um, of programmability to one where the the programs are constrained by the infrastructure to um, to do good stuff and um, not do bad stuff so to give you an example of of an approach that you might use there. You might use formal methods to ensure that, um, that, that code has been verified. You might, um, you, you, you might uh, mark it with a signature. Uh, what we've done in TA4 is we focused on um, a challenge which is to try to defend against a trillion node Mirai botnet um, because there's been a lot of speculation that we, that, that we could actually get to a trillion IoT devices. So if, if that occurs and um, you know, we, we have something of that scale, um, it will not be a pretty picture. So, you know, we've set a stretch goal like that. Um, and, uh, you, know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be testing aggressively, um, you know, to see if people can meet that. Um, and I'm gonna finish up quickly because I understand that, I understand that, um, that we're over soon, but uh, one, of the, one of the craziest ideas, and, and you know, we, we do crazy ideas, um, that we're trying is we realized that um, given the, the portability, the generality, and the code quality of open source software, it sometimes takes the open source community longer to get to the polished product that, that you know, that you, that, that you want to ship. Um, and one of the main problems with telecom software is that for interoperability, it has to be built according to standards. And so um, we took a look at the process of moving from a standard to working code and we're betting in TA1, technical area one, that the 3GPP and other standards documents 
are not Finnegan's Wake. And um, uh, what we mean by, by that statement is that the standards documents are um, using a specialized vocabulary. They're, they're formatted and structured in a way that um, should allow natural language processing techniques to get some traction. So we're taking a run at building software systems that will um, essentially read, read standards documents and produce either intermediate forms of code or perhaps if, if we are as successful as I hope we are, um, we'll, we'll produce uh, um, big chunks of working uh, C, C++ or other code. So uh, with that, I think I'm done. If I'm if I'm yeah. paying attention to <laughs> no no no, I, that that is fine. I mean, uh, JMS, I'm, we were just so intensely listening to your thoughts and research. But uh, if you can hang on, we may have a couple of questions as well coming from. Oh, the absolutely. I, you know, I, I basically, yeah. I, 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 you know, I could talk forever on this. <laughs> it's a pleasure working with the Linux Foundation and the Linux community. Um, you know, I, I, I started at Bell Labs in 81, as you mentioned. So, you know, I've been, I've been with Unix and uh, networks for a long time. And, you know, it's great to see how, you know, it's great to see where we are. So, yep. no, I think, I um, think that's fair. That's Thanks. Fair. Yeah, no, I think it is very refreshing to hear uh, you know, the, the, the research, you know, like true research versus, you know, development and deployment, right? The true research being uh, a fundamental pillar of, I mean, it was always a pillar of DARPA, right? And, 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 and DOD, uh, but, you know, collaborating with universities as, you, as you're showing, you know, some of the top notch uh, CS departments, computer science departments, and collaborating with all the innovation that has happened in open source, uh, at the underlying layer, whether it's networking, 5G, edge, IoT, et cetera. And then, you know, contributing back into, you know, the, the community from a security perspective. So I think the, the, the intention that you communicated, you know, we really appreciate it because at the end of the day, I think everybody benefits, right? The, the government benefits as a user, obviously, but the open source community benefits because it's more secure. Uh, telcos benefit, right? And, and I think that cycle is, I think, what uh, we really appreciate. So there are, there are a couple of questions uh, uh, that have come in. And again, for those of you who are, who are uh, you know, not yet familiar with this uh, platform, you know, there's a click Q&A button on the right of your session, just, just or I think it's on the top. Uh, just send the questions over. But uh, the question is, you know, if, um, if you implement standards, uh, uh, obviously on the edge and, and core, uh, how secure will it be so that people cannot infiltrate the 5G networks, right? If there's any backdoor manufacturing things that have happened uh, and, and, at, and at the scale of, uh, I think what DOD warned five years ago, right? So I, I, I think from, from a perspective of security, how, how do you see the, the next you know, couple of years using this strategy? Okay, here we go. So um, what, I, what I see happening is, um, so, so my view of security is that is the, the right stuff happening at the right place at the right time and the wrong stuff not happening. So you could, Imagine that uh, consumer devices might be optimized for ease of setup because it's very costly to have personnel on the phone. 
So you make the device very promiscuous. Um, it has lots of ports open. Um, you know, it reaches out in Bluetooth and everything else trying to, uh, you know, auto set up. Um, now that, that turns out to be, that turns out to be a great model for um, not taking any service calls, et cetera. But it is not a good model for um, having, you know, a, a giant attack surface because if there's one bug in any of those ports that have been opened, you've, you've got a problem. So when, when, you know, when I think of, when I think of the way things are done today, um, and it's probably the way that you have your home set up, um, I, I have a gateway and, and the gateway um, is my boundary between my personal policy and the policy of the network infrastructure that I connect to. So I think that um, I think that what um, we're talking about with 5G and the edge devices is, in some sense, we're moving some functionality um, and some of the role uh, for securing things into the public network. And um, it, it's, it's, it's not quite the same thing, excuse me, as the, um, as, as the model uh, where we're, we're, we're kind of hierarchical and there's federated structure. Uh, I mean, I think the, the mobile network operators are offering some, you know, extremely exciting capabilities. But, um, you know, the reason, that, the reason that we're investing in edge devices is that what, what we would like is for there to be um, no cost difference so that people will not buy cheap and insecure um, and, you know, then later discover that they didn't want to buy insecure. Rather, um, you know, the, the idea is that there will be secure infrastructure and, um, you know, there'll be vendors who will be able to sell it at a price competitive with, you know, you know, with junky insecure stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's cool. And I think there are a couple of questions related to that, which is how do we expect, uh, you know, global uh, players to contribute to the effort, right, in terms of, of uh, you know, of, of the projects or more importantly, sort of the upstream downstream. And I think the, the one thing I would highlight uh, personally having kind of worked through this is, you know, because, you know, we can view uh, this project as utilizing, you know, the upstream uh, open source projects within LFN, say, you know, ONAP, et cetera, LF, LF Edge, like a Crano, et cetera, or even ORAN and uh, uh, Kubernetes, or, you know, many, many, you know, uh, projects that are uh, underneath it. What we are going to see is, you know, an end user like Adarpa, right, and a government, right, would, would contribute back any research or any findings or anything from an open source perspective and upstream it with the help of the community, right? So the the work, actual collaboration and the entity, and this is open source 101, you know, always push stuff to upstream, don't fork, don't play it out. And I think that's how we are setting this up, which is clean. And it's always done in the open community, open source uh, world through a commercial ecosystem that exists as part of Linux Foundation. So I'm, I'm just trying to paraphrase the question and kind of answer the setup as well that we have for Linux Foundation. So any other thoughts, uh, JMS, that you want to add on that? Well, I think, I think that, that, <clears throat> that what you're going to get is you're going to get a lot of evolution and this will affect the global community. You're going to get a evolution in the applications 
that people want to use these devices for. Um, uh, uh, I don't think, you know, if we, if we roll back the clock many, many years, that, um, that the vision was, say, to interconnect supercomputers with the internet. But, but in reality, you know, most of the bytes that are moving on the internet today are email, um, social networking, uh, data, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I don't think we'll be able to fully um, envision what, what will happen, but, you know, I, I see, I see, um, I see, for example, that you, you imagine the following. So let's say you're on a curvy road in the Alps. Um, you could conceivably have cameras placed ahead of you on the curve and have your automobile reach out um, and give you a view around the curve, which today people might hack up with mirrors. But you know, you could you could do that with an IoT device in 5G because you have the capacity with the 5G offerings to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is just this is to just take one crisp example of a safety application that might be considered a useful public infrastructure, but it has to be secure because what you don't want somebody doing is monkeying with this. And for example, um, you know, showing, showing um, uh, nothing there and you have, a, you know, a, a, a double semi tractor trailer coming <laughs> around the curve. So, you know, that, that's just an example of how, of how we think, um, you know, security helps everyone. It's, 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 uh, you know, there seem to be people who like to monkey around with, with systems that are trying to help people and we're trying to stop that. I think that's, that's a great statement to sort of uh, wrap this up, but very, very insightful. And, and I know we can go on for days, but thank you, JMS. For, sure, ab for absolutely. Pleasure, very... pleasure, pleasure, to, pleasure to work with you guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, uh, okay, with that insight, uh, I think we move to another sort of uh, an enterprise and user. Um, and, and for those of you who may not know, you know, Walmart, I think, uh, I don't think you should be on the call. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, but we have, uh, you know, from the Office of CTO, Senior Director of Technology and Commercialization, uh, Subhadra. Uh, and she is actually the, uh, you know, brains behind figuring out how to, you know, lead with technology, how to lead with open technology uh, in a specific enterprise vertical, right? In this case, you know, retail, but how that can be utilized across a lot more and what they are doing to kind of step up the game here. So with that, let me welcome uh, Subhadra on the, on the call. Thank you so much, Arpit, and thank you so much for the warm introduction, as well as the opportunity to make our first, I think, um, uh, presentation here in this absolutely fantastic organization and forum. Um, as Arpit said, um, Walmart, almost everyone knows Walmart. Uh, we are the largest retailer. Um, traditionally, our businesses have been uh, operated in store, uh, from stores and uh, clubs, uh, and recently on e-commerce or online. Um, and as when, when Arpit and team asked me to do a presentation here uh, on how, what is open source um, positioning within Walmart, as well as how 
uh, Walmart can contribute back to the community in lens of, with a view and in the lens with uh, what is happening in the last one year due to pandemic and everything else. I thought this was a fantastic opportunity to kind of illustrate some of the challenges Walmart had had to face in the last one year and, and how we were able to absolutely use the open source technology um, available in the community to scale our business as well as some of the not so well-known contributions back to the community in the recent past and what we plan to do in the next couple of years to come in contributing back to the community and to forming an extremely symbiotic, fruitful relationship. Next slide, please. So, so this is just a quick illustration of the business impact. We all have had a tremendous impact. I absolutely resonated when Priyanka was talking about um, um, uh, the changes that the pandemic um, brought about in not just in our daily lives, but also how businesses work. Just to give you an illustration of scale, um, we, we service 222 million customers across omni-channel, across 24 countries. Um, we, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting tidbit that uh, when everybody else was running out of toilet papers, we were able to actually provide those toilet papers. That was, that was quite, quite interesting and I thought that I should just put it in here. Um, traditionally, most of Walmart customers have the percentage of Walmart transactions were primarily in store and in clubs and not necessarily uh, as much in terms of percentage online. What COVID has done is completely flip it for us. We've seen up to 76% increase in increase in e-commerce traffic. We also observed that there was a significant change in customer patterns, behavior patterns. More and more Walmart, more and more customers were coming to Walmart first, second, because of price, EDLC strategy. Second, we observed was more and more customers were buying online, but picking up in store. So technologies like BOPIS and check-in not only had to be developed fast, but also we had to scale really fast. We also understood that hyper-personalization, although it had all was already happening, but it accelerated during the COVID times. Given the changing customer patterns, what we observed was stores now, instead of being the product discovery and transaction centers, were becoming in or morphing into fulfillment centers. And um, so advent of new technology, how ensuring that latency requirements to support our associates who are fulfilling these orders. How does supply chain work? What kind of technology needs to be hosted where? All of those became more and more important problems for us to solve during the last year. And most importantly, rising volumes was fantastic for our business, but given retail business and our operating margins, operational efficiencies became paramount for us. So how did this impact technology? We had to absolutely modernize our tech stack. We were already on that process. Last year, our 2018, uh, 19 was a big year for us to modernize our tech stack. We are increasingly moving our workloads to cloud. We have now an analytics workload completely on cloud. We have 1.7 petabytes of data residing there. But it also meant that we also had a significantly large on-prem presence. So we operate in a hybrid cloud environment. We have presence on Azure, Google, as well as on on-prem in our own data centers. Not only that, we also had to figure out how to scale our fleet up and down seamlessly in a way that actually had minimal impact in availability reliability, as well as security. As part of this whole process of modernizing tech stack, modernizing, making sure that our fleet was available and, or, or, or available for uh, sourcing traffic, et cetera, um, the very first tenant, as we all know, for, 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 a, for a highly available system is observability. And we, we observability became even bigger principle in how we design our systems, how do we restructure, re-architect our fleet, how do we make them cloud native, so on and so forth. Observability, observability at every layer of our stack. 
And as I said, stores were morphing. Stores were morphing into fulfillment centers from a business perspective. But then we start to look at, and in the past, we, as an example, we had three nodes uh, in store to uh, deploy business continuity applications for very critical applications like cloud power checkout. So checkout, as an example, in store was absolutely critical for us. However, as more and more technology was being used by us for uh, the changing customer patterns, cloud, uh, our, our edge presence in store and how we then think about edge platform for Walmart start to change as well. And to, again, um, and, and, and uh, through the process, most importantly, um, just to take a step back, in the last three to four years, I think Walmart is very proud to know, I mean, it's, 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 it's very little known fact, but we are one of the extremely early adopters of AI and ML to drive operational efficiencies within retail sector. And we have had tremendous amount of returns in terms of efficiencies due to, um, due to these uh, measures. And we will continue to invest in AI and ML in the next foreseeable future. And then COVID has definitely accelerated that, that investment. Next slide, please. So, so we just talked about business impact of COVID. How did that impact our technology stack? What did we have to do? Um, and again, I always, um, I, I joined Walmart a couple of months ago and, and it always amazes me that it's, it's almost Im impossible for to run such an extremely large efficient operation without latest and greatest technology. Um, we don't talk very much about it outside Walmart. Um, we are huge consumers of open source technology. We have Node.js to OpenStack. On the left-hand side, what you're seeing is just a few open source technologies that we actually currently use and has helped us to do exactly what we talked in the previous slide, which is ensuring our tech stack is able to scale, scale seamlessly, and be able to then um, uh, work for uh, the future use cases. Um, on the right side, which again, Walmart is not very known for, and hopefully with this collaboration with Linux Foundation, we will be a bit more um, out there. Um, we have actively open sourced, these are the top three projects in the last year and a half. Electrode is our Node.js framework. Um, OneOps is essentially our cloud deployment and workload management um, platform, um, primarily earlier designed for uh, VMs, but again, you all, as I mentioned earlier, we operate in a multi-cloud environment. Our store nodes, which is we also are also managed through OneOps, um, and in the next iteration of OneOps is actually our Kubernetes-based, uh, what is called as WCNP, um, but essentially it's again another uh, cloud management, workload management software, deployment software um, that manages regardless of whether your workload sits, whether it's on-prem, off-prem, edge, et cetera. And then Concord is our CI CD platform. So, so again, I think what I want to kind of illustrate here is um, just from a business consumer perspective, Although Walmart I may mean, be no more known as a retail giant, what has powered Walmart's business and operations has been A, technology, B, investments in infrastructure and, and, and um, innovations that has helped scale and scale up our technology stack. And three, absolute, um, 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 I wouldn't say, collaboration as much as usage right now, but in the future collaboration with the open, stack, open source community to actually help us uh, attain that scale. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so bringing it down to the topic of today, right? Edge cloud networking area. Um, so some of the open source technology that we've used um, to solve the similar problems that we talked about is Envoy and Istio. Um, Istio was opt in last year, but now we're moving to opt out. So, so across all applications. So it is becoming even more important for us to be able to um, understand what services we operate, understand, uh, have a fantastic topology of, of everything that we run, regardless of where we run and be able to then effectively manage 
and get, get, get the observability we need. EBPF is another uh, significant player in, in, in what we have um, been able to do on the network and networking side. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, we are in, in, in the early, uh, early phase of figuring out how to give back what we have done with EB, EBPF to the developer community. One example of what we were able to achieve through our EBPF solution is that um, we were able to control uh, the connection limit as a, as, as a feature set. So number of current concurrent connections on T1 proxy node. Um, so we had um, during the Christmas time, the shopping season, we had an event and we were able to control the number of networks um, that were, or the number of connections that were coming in. We were able to very effectively manage them and have, um, 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 have um, a, a way of still maintaining our customer experience without necessarily taking down the entire site. Um, so we will be talking a little bit more, hopefully in the next few weeks about what that EBPF solution is and how we are planning to open source it through the next foundation. Um, and of course, uh, we are active members of CNCF and we've had other um, 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 open source technology that we've used in the past and we hope to continue to use it in the future as well. Um, again, um, next slide, please. Um, so again, my, my, my talk is fairly short. Uh, I was given 15 minutes, um, so I thought 10 minutes for speaking, but very quickly. Um, so Arpit had asked me, so what was, would be uh, Walmart's call out to the open source community? Um, again, this is a stance we are taking. Um, in the last three to four years, we have, we have done a tremendous amount of investments in not just uh, using open source technology, but also pro giving back to the community. Uh, we hope and uh, that we are able to form collaborative partnerships across this community, uh, you know, through Linux Foundation's help. Uh, there are many, uh, again, uh, the WCNP or one Ops uh, workload management and workload deployment software. Uh, we plan to uh, open source it as well. We plan to make sure that others can benefit through a multi-cloud um, deployment tool that we have greatly benefited from. It has increased developer productivity. Deployment doesn't happen uh, as painfully as it used to, especially, you know, we are very few, one of the very few companies uh, that have also extremely important workloads running in Edge in our stores. So we hope that uh, the community um, is uh, we were able to we were able to make a call out to the community to effectively partner with us. Um, early adoption um, again, this is another call out. Um, you know, uh, we are with Walmart scale uh, and complexity. Um, uh, very few other companies uh, will want to solve and then provide it back to the community. So um, early, uh, adopting some of our software early on will, prior, will hopefully give you uh, the benefits that we have reaped and, and, and we can form a symbiotic relationship. And then from a prioritization perspective, I hope that we are able to um, prioritize this, uh, some of our technologies for all of us uh, collectively. To, to, to read the benefits. So all in all, I think there are three different big call outs. One is um, that we want to be, um, we are making a statement here that we want to be, become even more active partners in and collaborators in the open source community. Uh, the second is uh, there are many open source um, technologies that we've used in the past, um, you know, whether it's Envoy or Istio for, uh, for service mesh and, um, uh, other other use cases or uh, EBPF based um, uh, technologies for network functions, deployment of network functions, and example observability within our stack, or um, um, and and as part of that uh, whole ecosystem, we hope that we can become bigger partners and uh, play a bigger role in the in, in the community going forward. Um, so thank you. All right, excellent. Uh, so I, 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 I know we're a couple of minutes late, but I do want to uh, take one question, which is really a summary of five similar questions that have come in. Most of all of the questions are related to the decade old question, you know, 
is centralization good or is distributed good, right? And specifically in the context of edge. So the question really surrounds the, the Walmart strategy where, you know, uh, whether it's because of COVID or just online or whatever, right? Uh, what do you have to do to, you know, which workloads really are relevant in the edge data centers slash stores slash distributed sort of uh, retail outlets versus centralization, right? Yeah, so um, it's, so as we are, that's an excellent question, by the way. In fact, that's exactly what I and my team are right now thinking to figure out what is our edge strategy. What kind of workloads should be our edge? What should be our edge platform as a service, as an example, whether it's internal or external, what should we do with there? The ones that came to light very quickly, and I'll first talk about overall edge use cases, and I can then talk a little specific about Walmart's edge use cases. The one, the workloads that are overall feel like that can be deployed on the edge are primarily the one that require, and again, it's a, it's a very, um, it require, low latency and high comp fast compute, right? Uh, extremely data-driven. Um, we have seen workloads like AI and audio AR VR workloads that we need to have a fairly significant and robust edge, edge platform. Uh, we are investing heavily in uh, security that is driven by, um, um, by cameras. So processing images extremely fast and being able to inference, so AI and ML driven inferencing. So anything that you have to very quickly uh, inference and which will affect your latency is going to be a challenge for us. So those workloads will be on edge. We already have a GPU uh, nodes on ev in every store to be able to process uh, those use cases, security related use cases. Um, checkout and uh, payment systems, payment gateways. So we are introducing um, self-checkouts. Uh, we are introducing um, uh, seamless shopping experience within stores as well. Uh, this is again, one of our COVID learnings. So a combination of security and checkout will be very critical where latency is critical for us. We cannot to reduce fraud and other things. Um, we are also experimenting with uh, drones um, and uh, anything that is related to a chatty application if the drone architecture is not right. But most importantly, we don't see that chattiness, but what we see is that there is a significant amount of data offloading that is required for anything autonomous devices, whether it's drones, whether it's vehicles within uh, Walmart's um, uh, fleet or uh, even robotics within um, that, 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 that happen, that are used within Walmart's uh, infrastructure and space. We have seen those use cases where there's a significant amount of data offloading and computation that is required. So those are the, some use cases that we feel that edge will become extremely critical. For oh us. my God, yeah. This is very much in line with, I think, what the community is thinking. So very good. Thank you very much for, for giving your insights here at the, at the summit. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. And then, um, you, know, uh, you know, I would say, the the uh, the next presentation requires no introduction, right? Um, Andre Thuch and AT and T, you know, are the poster child of open source uh, thought leadership. They have been leading the global ecosystem on how to think open, how to change, you know, capex, opex, you know, radicalizing SDN, NFE, automation you know, and, and kind of showing the rest of us the way. So, and, and I, you know, if I introduce Andre, then I think I'll get some negative points because, you know, that's like not a good thing. And everybody knows Andre, so take it on. He's... Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, this is uh, hopefully a, a a much brighter, uplifting year we're heading into uh, compared to last year. And, um, and certainly, you know, with the pandemic and everything we experienced last year, uh, it, it, it undoubtedly changed the world. Um, and I'll, I will say the one thing that hasn't changed here at AT&T uh, is really our commitment to uh, keeping our customers connected. And you know, the work we do at at and is really critical to millions of people, businesses and first responders, 
uh, not just throughout uh, the United States, but throughout the world. And I'm really proud to say that our network uh, has really withstood this test in time. And um, I can't say enough about not just the amazing technology that delivered that, but also the amazing people that were behind that technology. And um, while we didn't see COVID coming, um, we've done a tremendous amount of building and investing in our network over the past several years that have really paid dividends during this crisis. And I'm gonna share a bit about that uh, shortly. Um, if you look at the investment we've made, um, we put in well over $135 billion over the past five years uh, into our United States uh, infrastructure to build a very robust network with self-healing architectures, uh, open standards that have really helped us get ready for this, uh, you know, arguably unforeseen moment in history that we all have been experiencing. So if we go to the next slide, um, let me kind of show you some data behind what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, when it comes to our network, it, even without COVID, we were carrying more data uh, than ever before. Um, in fact, our global network carries more than 450 petabytes of data traffic on an average day. That's, that's quite a bit of traffic. Um, you can see on this chart here on the left, um, and it coincidentally, it was exactly one year ago to this day, March 10th, 2020, when we began to see really the first major traffic surge uh, that you could argue was due to the, the COVID stay at home mandates that were being issued um, across the country, uh, not to mention uh, across the world. And um, you can quickly see uh, the surge, the jump we saw across uh, our backbone network as depicted in this graph. We saw over a 20% increase in traffic in just three weeks compared to uh, pre-pandemic figures. It's pretty astounding. And as you can look, um, you can see the growth really has not slowed. Um, if you pay attention to sort of the right-hand side of that graph, you can also see a late surge uh, towards the end of the year. And I get a lot of questions like, what happened there? Well, it may be a, a distant memory or maybe uh, not too long ago, we had a lot going on in the last uh, few months of the year. Um, of course, we had the elections going on, so we saw a lot of traffic uh, going across the network in terms of uh, what you're seeing with the social media networks, a lot of uploading of videos and downloading of videos. We also saw this tremendous surge in 4K traffic. That's 4K video streaming. And this really corresponds to uh, a lot of the strong 4K TV sales uh, that were reported uh, in the last quarter. Uh, as you probably know, with everyone being home, uh, a lot of folks out there, uh, I guess, decided to upgrade their, their display sets. And of course, if you're going to upgrade, you want to go with the latest. And uh, so 4K has uh, certainly showed up in the statistics. We also saw a great increase um, in iCloud traffic, too. Uh, we all know Apple launched their latest and greatest iPhone. And uh, that has been a, a very popular product. And of course, as people have been syncing up their pictures and videos, we saw a lot of upstreaming traffic hit the network as well. So that's, that sort of accounts for that, um, some of the components in that big surge you see towards the end of the year. Um, I wanna just share a couple other interesting data points that we saw throughout the year. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, um, customers twice set the record for text messaging. Um, during the March spring break last year uh, and on Easter weekend, uh, people were sending uh, at one point more than 23,000 text messages per second across the AT&T network. Um, you know, if you look at the previous peak pre-pandemic, that was about 15,000 uh, texts per second. So that's about a 53% 50, increase 
uh, compared to pre-pandemic levels. Also, um, believe it or not, voice is popular. Um, voice became popular again. Um, wireless uh, voice uh, usage soared. Uh, we saw over a 40% increase as uh, people began to work from home and use their mobile uh, devices to attend meetings and conference calls and uh, you know, to uh, connect in and stay productive. Um, of course, um, also interesting, um, that was voice that surged, but what's interesting on mobile data, and maybe this is surprising to some, uh, but mobile data volumes actually slightly decreased uh, during the uh, early part of COVID uh, last year, since many people um, were connecting their mobile smartphones to their Wi-Fi broadband connected networks at home. And so that sort of accounts for why we would see on the cellular network kind of a, a decrease on the, on the data side there. Now, I also wanna talk a bit about our first responders, and this is a really important part of AT&T's network. We built a whole separate network dedicated to first responders. We call it FirstNet. And thanks to the unique benefits like uh, dedicated connectivity when it's necessary, always on priority and preemption, and also a very high quality uh, dedicated spectrum of uh, what we call band 14, uh, FirstNet is one of the fastest commercial networks out there. And we have over 2 million uh, connections on this first net network. Um, and we're also seeing some interesting uh, behaviors and statistics there where first responders consume more than twice as much data as our general consumers, reinforcing the need and importance of having a network purpose built for public safety. Um, our at t network was able to withstand this unprecedented new normal of demand as you can see in that chart. And, uh, and that was really uh, thanks to the investments that were made uh, and a lot of behind the scenes work that we uh, frankly put into these open initiatives um, over the past decade. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more here on the next slide of what we've done there. So a lot of this was started uh, um, with a, a program um, about seven years ago now that was really, we set out uh, to virtualize and, and software enable uh, the majority of our network. And uh, this is really the foundation of everything we do. And part of this really important foundation is open source technology. And the advances we've made in, in cloud native virtualization, containerization, uh, hardware and software disaggregation have really allowed us to reach our software-based networking goals of 75%. This was a goal that we pledged um, many years ago to hit by the end of uh, 2020. And I'm proud to say that we not only hit that goal, but we surpassed it. And right now we're well over 77%. Um, so a lot of great work and uh, kudos to the folks, the many, many great people that were behind making that happen. And especially the many, many open source software projects out there that we've been a part of in those communities that have helped us get there. So having a much more software centric network really enables us to respond rapidly to any new demand on the network. Um, you know, even those that are caused by uh, pandemics. Uh, just a couple quick examples here. Uh, I mentioned voice becoming popular. Uh, voice over Wi-Fi was 100% virtualized prior to uh, COVID-19. And uh, that's really thanks to the great work that we did uh, to roll out and deploy our virtualized evolved data packet gateways. Uh, that's a, a, a network component that we use internally. And these functions run basically on OpenStack on our, on our internal network cloud. And we use ONAP for orchestration and data analytics. Uh, and in addition, we also have our engineering and operations team using uh, quite a large suite of open source tools to help monitor and manage 
uh, what's running in production. Um, you know, during the first few months in the pandemic, Wi-Fi calling averaged 90% higher than pre-COVID levels. And not surprisingly, the average call duration was over 75% longer than pre-COVID. Um, and that network worked flawlessly. And, um, and again, that was because of this great foundation that was really based on um, a lot of good work and, and open, open standards and open source. Um, another great example is uh, what we've done in our, what we call our SD-WAN service space. This is a global service that we offer to our enterprise customers. Basically, this is, um, uh, think of it as enterprise uh, VPNs for employees to access their private corporate networks from anywhere they might be on any type of ordinary broadband access. And as most of us saw early on in COVID and even still today, um, home access to these private corporate networks is absolutely essential. Um, there was a dramatic increase in usage of these services during the COVID-19 spread um, across the world. In fact, we saw a 16 uh, times demand surge uh, compared to the average usage in 2019. Um, the virtualization of the service allowed us to dynamically increase our capacity to meet the surging demand uh, in weeks. Uh, so again, a great testament to a lot of the software behind this great service. Um, also, mobile messaging, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, here at at and we experienced a three years of text messaging growth in just one week. Um, and that was... Uh, uh, Again, uh, something we've never seen prior. And uh, we uh, fortunately had moved this messaging traffic from our legacy infrastructure to our cloud-based infrastructure, again, our internal network cloud-based infrastructure to assist uh, <clears throat> the offload and really help this demand, uh, to help serve this demand surge. And our software-enabled network allowed us to add more than 60% capacity to our messaging platform in just one day. Um, so, you know, as you can see from these examples, this is really the power of having an open, automated, software-centric network. And it enables a much more agile, dynamic network that can elastically scale uh, to meet, you know, whatever the demands and needs are uh, that we throw at it. So if we go on to the next slide here, um, and this is my last slide, just quickly here, I wanna just share um, just a few of the projects of the many open source projects that we've been participating uh, in the community with and uh, just highlight a couple uh, areas that have really helped us uh, position our network and to deliver some of the examples I just walked you through. Um, first, uh, the Open Compute Project, um, you know, we previously submitted designs for several open disaggregated routing platforms to uh, OCP. And since then, we've been uh, deploying our next gen IP MPLS core routing platform into our production network based on this open hardware design uh, reference spec. Um, we also chose some, uh, uh, brought in some very uh, new and innovative disruptive suppliers, uh, such as DriveNets, uh, and they're providing the network operating system software for this uh, core use case. And it's in production today and it's working quite well. Um, we also followed up uh, with our first at and IP uh, edge use case, a peering use case. Uh, which is also running uh, in our production network today. It's actually running on the exact same hardware as our core. However, we chose um, a different uh, software layer, a different NOS. And in this case here, we chose Cisco and their iOS XR network operating system to provide the management and control functions for uh, at and IP Edge network. And this is really the start of a journey to converge the, the Spirit uh, Edge implementations we have today uh, onto a more common software and hardware driving 
uh, platform that really delivers uniformity, simplification, and agility. And this is what's um, really going to power our network for the next decade um, as we see, you know, continued growth. I call it, you know, the tsunami of demand that hits our network each and every day. Um, another uh, uh, really important project here um, that we've got launched here is Airship. Um, and, you know, AT&T's 5G cloud infrastructure uh, is really enabled by Airship and the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF. And uh, recently, at t we contributed Airship, uh, which is a, a purpose-built high-performance network cloud infrastructure that integrates about 14 different CN uh, CNCF projects together. And uh, at and network cloud uses Airship in, uh, in production today to really enable faster deployments, uh, much greater scale, uh, and ensures a 100% consistency um, that the network is, is uh, operating uh, as we uh, expect it and, and, and certainly ensures that it's also secured as we need it. And I'm proud to say, as of now, Airship is a certified Kubernetes distribution under the CNCF conformance program. Um, this provides us lots of great key benefits, uh, to name a few, uh, you know, really consistency to simplify interactions for users. It gives us timely updates, so we always have the latest features the community has been working on. Uh, and then conformability, so that any user can confirm that their distribution or platform remains conformant by running the identical open source conformance applications that was used to uh, certify it in the first place. So we're really, um, really happy with how that's working and uh, uh, a really great project. Um, another uh, uh, project, a new project, it's not really a new project, it's really a um, uh, a convergence of two other project, two projects together, uh, just renamed uh, uh, a new kit. I'm very excited about uh, the merging of CNTT and OPNFE. They've come together into this single entity here, and uh, the merger here really uh, builds on a rich development history that we've had with uh, OPNFE and the substantial specification management from CNTT. And this move will empower the global communications community, we hope, to really better bring together the various reference cloud, <clears throat> excuse me, reference cloud infrastructure models and architectures um, together and uh, to allow us to go much faster in how we deploy to be much more reliable and of course to be much more secure. So really a great collaborate uh, collaboration here and uh, we're really excited to be part of this and looking forward to uh, uh, lots of new advances to come here. Um, <clears throat> of course, I can't talk about open source without talking about the RAN, the radio access network. And of course the RAN, we're all about ORAN, the ORAN Alliance. And specifically um, the ORAN Alliance in the ORAN software community are really two important and very complementary open initiatives. And the goal of ORAN is to really enable new participants to come in into uh, the RAN space by disaggregating the RAN with open uh, interfaces. And the ORAN software community continues to grow it um, as we've just completed our Cherry release um, just late last year. And we're gonna be moving um, the ORAN uh, ecosystem closer to commercial deployments around the globe. Um, the number of individual contributors and, and software commits have really grown significantly over the past year. And we're really uh, proud about that. Um, the lat, uh, lat, I should say the latest release also creates uh, a new software project, uh, Service Management and Orchestration, SMO and continues to build an open interface to drive development of auto configuration and management of ORAN elements. 
Uh, now, to show how far ORAN has progressed towards practical implementation, AT&T along with Nokia, uh, we just recently completed a proof of concept de demonstrating a full end-to-end -end, uh, layer three call over a fully virtualized cloud RAN. And this successful trial represents a really key milestone for us in improving out um, the maturity and the capability um, of, a, of, of a truly open architecture. So we're really excited about this. And then last but not least, I, um, I have to uh, talk a bit about ONAP and uh, specifically a lot going on there, but specifically I wanna just mention the alignment of ONAP with ORAN. Uh, ONAP does many different things, uh, but one particular area is how ONAP is helping us with our 5G and ORAN initiatives. And uh, ONAP is positioned to serve as a, uh, an open source implementation, really supporting the, uh, as I mentioned, the ORAN service management and orchestration functionality, and also this uh, non-real-time RAN intelligent controller that we've been working on. And as we all know, data is the lifeblood of a network and it's critical uh, to drive, uh, if you wanna drive a really intelligent, agile network, you gotta have lots of data and you also have to have a lot of capabilities. Of course, we're looking to AI and machine learning type implementations to drive better orchestration and control. And ONAP is a great uh, platform for us to really pull that together and to start supporting that. So, um, Many other open source projects out there also that we're engaged in. I don't have the time to mention them all, but I do want to thank all of the open source communities. Um, I, I, I do want to throw some shots out to Acumos, Acreno, and De, uh, Danos, uh, and thank everyone for all your con con contributions. And I definitely want to thank uh, all of you for your help and support uh, to help build these projects and make them what they are today. So with that, uh, Arpit, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, no, this is awesome, Andre. Every time you say and give us insights, it's just out, out of the world, right? Like, and you know, the very fact that exactly a year ago, March 10th is when you got the spike. It's just been a year. Fantastic. So I don't know. Did you plan that or something? I was like, no, I looked at no. the calendar. I'm like, wow, no, this is it, amazing. It's a year's anniversary of the AT&T spike. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. But there are so many questions. I'm going to have a couple, uh, a time for a couple um, that are very relevant. The first one being, uh, how is AT&T aligning org changes uh, given the software defined world? That's the first question in terms of skill sets and people. The second question is more, you know, do we expect network traffic patterns uh, caused by COVID going back to quote normal or any different? So those are kind of two, I think, important questions for people to understand. Yeah, let me let me uh, take the uh, second question first, and just um, and I'll, I'll you know give you kind of a sneak peek. You saw, you know, you saw the chart for 2020. You're probably wondering, well, gee, what happened? You know, what's happened in the last couple of months? Um, I, I'll just say that the curve just keeps going up. And um, so, and, and that's probably not a surprise, right? Um, and it's, it's pretty, uh, if you think about, you know, how connected our lives are, um, you know, the, there's recent surveys that, you know, when you interview people, they'll actually say, you know, having uh, internet connectivity ranks right up there with, you know, electricity and indoor plumbing. Um, and in some cases, I think uh, when you ask sort of the younger demographic, they would rather give up indoor plumbing than give up their internet. <laughs> so um, I think demand, uh, we can just count on it. Um, you know, everything, uh, if, if you look at everything in your house, uh, what you wear, wearables, like I've got um, appliances now, uh, even, uh, you know, I, I've seen connected now vacuum cleaners. I mean, it's just uh, demands going up and up. I would say what's also interesting, a new phenomena we're seeing here is uplink. 
um, you know, more, you know, typically, um, you know, the asymmetric nature of traffic of downlink to uplink is sort of traditionally been 10 to one. We see that changing more and more where uplink is more and more relevant. And that shouldn't be surprising, right? As, as our lives become more connected. Um, and it's not just us, you know, uploading more TikTok videos or YouTube videos, that's certainly growing, but also it's all the connected machines in our lives are that are uploading their data. Uh, so we will see continued growth there. Um, as far as the first question goes around, you know, just organizationally, what have we done? Um, what we've done is we've taken a lot of the, uh, the knowledge um, and people and the tools and the systems within AT&T that were incubated, incubated in this more central uh, area within the network. And we've actually distributed that out more and more into the business units. And what we've done with these tools is also enable them so that our business clients within the company can take advantage of those uh, the much, much more um, within their own communities, um, as opposed to having to, you know, uh, sort of uh, contract, if you will, into and have a very technical person try to describe their business problems and, and work solutions. What, what it's all about is enabling and making that data available, but also making the capabilities, the tool sets that utilize that data available as well. So I tell you, you know, at a high level, you see a distribution of that talent going in all areas of the business. Very good, very good, excellent. I know we are a couple of minutes over the hour. There are a few other questions, we'll take them offline. I think there's one general uh, uh, couple of questions on the same thread on, on, uh, on the uh, geopolitical nature of open source collaboration. So let me handle that. Uh, you know, open source and Linux Foundation in general, we have put out several advisory notices, but we are a global community. And if you don't believe that, you know, join us tomorrow. Uh, you know, we have uh, several of our leaders from Asia talking about you know, innovation and how open source builds on each other. Uh, you know, there are no country, government, or people boundaries when it comes to open source and collaboration. That's what makes it really thriving. And I know, you know, some of the questions were in that domain, but I know we're over time, but Andre, as usual, very insightful. Thank you very much for doing this. And for everybody on the, on the call, I think we are at the end of today. We'll see you tomorrow uh, afternoon. Please log on for even more keynotes. Thank you, Andre. Thank you.